So we talked a little bit yesterday. We got interrupted by our fire drill, of course, um, and that's that's okay. Um, you know, we need to be safe. Um, but we had talked about um, some new technology that comes into Georgia after World War II, not just Georgia, but the country um, itself. We're still on the first page. Um, we talked a little bit about the Cold War. Um, and again, you know, that's one of those things we could spend months talking about. Um, actually dug up history of the Cold War, if anybody's interested, right there. Um, you know, we didn't go into any great detail. There, there's It's a huge story. We did talk about the domino theory just a little bit. Um, and then we ended up talking about the Korean War, um, which we called, or I called, and you may agree with me, you may not, the Forgotten War. Um, because it's just not something that's in the conscience of the American people. It, it has become more so um, because veterans tend to make a lot of noise and Korean veterans finally got it together and they started making a lot of noise. Um, we saw pictures of the Korean War Memorial. And again, um, when you get the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., that's one of those places you have to go. And I would go at night. Um, in fact, uh, there's several memorials I would advise you to visit at night. The Lincoln Memorial um, being one, and then walk across the street and you go visit the Korean War Memorial. Visit both of those at night. It's, it's really um, quite striking. I had never visited the Vietnam Memorial till um, I was in D.C. at a um, teacher seminar at Ford's Theater. Um, which was pretty cool. And my hotel was the Willard Hotel, which is, you know, it's been there forever. It's like two blocks from the White House. Midnight one night, I decided I'm going to take a walk. So I walked to the Vietnam Memorial at night, and I'd never seen it that way. And it, it was it was just an incredible experience. So anyway, has nothing to do with this. So Georgia after World War II, we're picking up where we kind of left off yesterday. After World War II, Georgia experiences tremendous growth and transformation. Georgia changes tremendously. The Georgia we see in 2021 is very different from the Georgia that was here in 1945 in a lot of different ways. Racially, things are different. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not even going to say on some days they're good, but they're different. Okay, economically, Georgia is a very different state than it was in 1945. Um, politically, it's a very different state than it was in 1945. Um, and we see that as we as we go through this, we're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about changes in agriculture. We're going to talk about the growth of Atlanta, because as Atlanta grows, what does the rest of the state do? grows as well, unless you're in South Georgia, and then you're just kind of out of luck. But um, there are things being done to change that, I think. And then finally, um, we're going to take a look at not only Governor Ellis and his progressive leadership, we're going to take just a quick glimpse at um, governors after World War II and see what they did. Okay? So strap it on tight, and here we go. All right, let's talk about agriculture first. The first thing that we, we see after World War II, and I guess it was really during World War II, is there's really not a need for tenant farmers anymore. Sharecropping and tenant farming kind of go by the wayside. Um, part of that is because of the New Deal, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And what did it do? Paid farmers not to grow stuff. Gave them a subsidy for not growing certain things. Um, and then we talked about, um, you know, the farming technological advances that, that came out, the, the inventions, the innovation that came about technologically. Um, that becomes firmly entrenched in Georgia. Farmers begin to use mechanized equipment, um, tractors, combines, harvesters, and it changes the face of Georgia agriculture. In 1945, there were 226,000 farms in Georgia. 
they were small farms for the most part, about 105 acres. By 1969, 24 years later, Georgia only had 67,000 farms. But look at what happens to them. They grow. They're much bigger farms. They average about 500 acres. 1945, um, 23 million, rather, 730,000 acres are being farmed. 24 years later, that number has increased um, by a third. Almost 10 million acres have been added to Georgia's farmland. So farms become what? Fewer, but larger. Okay? And I don't know what the statistic is today, but if we were to look at Georgia farms today, one of the things we would notice is that most farms are commercial farms. You know, gone are the days where you have a family that's farming and selling their um, their product on the market. A lot of it is owned by Del Monte and Green Giant and Goldkist and um, what's that chicken? Dyson chicken? Tyson, Tyson chicken, yeah. Tyson. Dyson's a vacuum cleaner. Um, so that, you know, it's continued to change over the years. And I'm sure it'll continue to change. Um, so we see the, the Georgia um, Department of Agriculture is sending out um, things like this. Um, I have a copy of the manufacturer's record from the Agricultural and Industrial Development Board of Georgia from 1948. So I'm going to let you pass that around and look at it. On the cover, you will see that Betty Sullivan was the 1948 peanut queen from Macon. She's 17 years old. And the peanut industry has grown from $7 million to $70 million annually. Isn't that exciting? The peanut queen. No, she was 17 in 1948. She, yeah, she might be. I guess she put on her sash and wore her evening gown and won. Um, one thing that really impacts Georgia agriculture is the development and the introduction of things like nylon and rayon. They are not natural fibers. You don't go pull nylon off the nylon tree. Okay? Um, they are chemical fabrics. They're made in a lab somewhere. Um, and what this does is something that came out in World War II. There's a shortage of cotton, and so there are alternatives, rayon and nylon. Um, and so what happens to the need for cotton is it goes down. The demand goes down. Um, farmers can't make a living just growing cotton, so they begin to do other things. They diversify. They grow trees. They grow peanuts, they grow soybean, they grow um, corn, they grow other um, crops besides cotton. And then again, we've got new farming technology, um, you know, tractors, harvesters. Today, um, you know, you have a GPS equipped tractor that's going to keep track of where you should turn where you should be as you're plowing, um, you know, just so much different than it used to be. So this helps, the, the, the mechanization helps um, farmers be able to, to produce more and harvest more. And it, sometimes that's a good, good thing and sometimes it's not. Um, some farmers just gave up growing stuff and said, we're going to raise chickens. You have been to a chicken farm? It stinks. Like you can't imagine. You ever been behind a chicken truck on the highway? All those live chickens in those little cages? Going, mock, 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 flapping their wings, you know, pooping, smelling. Okay. So, um, by 1970, one third of Georgia's agricultural output is chicken. And that number has done nothing but go up. Georgia can not only claim to be the carpet capital of the world, and the granite capital of the world, 
They're also the chicken capital of the world. Yay! That's right. So here's the problem. All these technological innovations, these changes in agriculture take jobs. Remember, we got rid of the tenant farmers. What are those farmers going to do? They're going to have to go to the city. They're going to have to find work or they're going to stay there and possibly find work. But they've got to They've got to change careers. They've got to find something else to do. Here's uh, those are some big chickens. I was impressed by those the other day. By the way, are chickens bigger today than they were when I was your age? Yes. You know why? GMO. Steroids. Okay. Yep. It used to be a good sized chicken breast, and my hand's pretty big. Hold up your hand, Aniston. It was about that size. Today, it would be bigger than my hand. That's a big piece of meat. And of course, what happens when people eat the chicken? They get bigger. There's a correlation between the size of chickens and the size of human beings. Can. So, Georgia moves from being who? King Cotton to being Queen Chicken. Dang girls. Just taking over. All right. Uh, Atlanta grows from, you know, a moderately sized city to the most important city in the South um, and a major city in the United States and eventually an international city. In 1940, as war is about to break out, 65% of Georgians live in rural areas. By 1976, 36 years later, that's been almost a 180-degree turn. Now, 60% of Georgians live in or near cities. Do you think that percentage has gone up or down? up. I would say it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% today. Um, particularly when you when you consider the fact that Monticello, anybody been to Monticello lately? I have. That's basically Atlanta. It's basically a suburb of Atlanta. There are people that live there that work in Atlanta every day. So it's become a bedroom community, a, a kind of a suburb. Um, and of course, Atlanta was the largest, it still is. Um, and Atlanta grows during the 50s and the 60s. Uh, we could argue as far back as the 1930s, Atlanta grows because of two people, William B. Hartsfield and Ivan Allen Jr. Now, Hartsfield is a name you ought to be familiar with, right? Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. Ivan Allen, you might be familiar. His father started a office supply company, and it grew to be a really large company in Atlanta. Um, but they are known, each are known for a particular thing when it comes to Atlanta. Hartsfield um, served as Atlanta's mayor for six terms, 1937 to 1961. And I think most of the time when you see somebody that's in office for that long, they lose their effectiveness. Hartsfield doesn't. He is all about building. And so he oversees the expressways, the interstates coming to Atlanta. If you look at this map over here, just when you get up, um, you see the big black dot there. That's Atlanta. There are no interstates on that map. And that's why it's hanging there. There are no interstates. All you see are railroads and, and side roads. So you know, in 1945, if you wanted to drive from Milledgeville to Atlanta, how do you get there? You go what we call back roads today because um, there was no expressway. 1925, um, he brings the air travel industry to Atlanta. He helps. Um, he's part of a group of people that 
um, select the location for the Atlanta airport. It was built on an old racetrack. Um, and today it looks nothing like it did in 1925. Um, he dies in 1971 and the airport is not Atlanta International Airport. It's now Hartsfield International Airport. And that was appropriate because he was all about uh, building and transportation. I mean, um, it's kind of hard not to see that, that he was so involved in growing Atlanta physically. <clears throat> Ivan Al, yes. Maynard Jackson was the first black mayor of Atlanta. And he actually, he actually did a lot to improve um, travel in Atlanta, uh, to promote Atlanta internationally. So, uh, changed it or added his name to it. Ivan Allen Jr. was mayor for eight years, 1962 to 1970. Of note, and I think it tells you a lot about the character of Ivan Allen, he is the only Southern politician to openly support the Civil Rights Act. And that took some gumption. Um, he steals the Atlanta Braves from Milwaukee, brings them south. They weren't the Atlanta Braves then. They, of course, were the... And before that, they were the Boston Braves. They are the oldest National League franchise. So he steals the Braves from Milwaukee, brings them to Atlanta. He um, helps negotiate the purchase of an NFL franchise um, by the Rankin-Smith family from the NFL, becomes the Atlanta Falcons. He steals the Hawks from St. Louis. And within a span of two years, Georgia goes from not having any professional sports teams to three. Um, not only that, he built Atlanta's Memorial Arts Cultural Center, a place where people can jo go and enjoy the arts, uh, performing arts and visual arts as well. and then. Also, Atlanta Civic Center, which is a performance arena or a performance area. I think it's finally been closed. I'm not sure. Miss um, Karen and I saw the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra there a couple of years ago. Uh, really, really a lot of fun. It was a Christmas concert, so it was a lot of fun. It was cold, too. It was cold. All right. So... For roughly $22 million, um, Atlanta has two places where the arts can be um, emphasized. Now, while we're talking about Ivan Allen, let's talk about the major league sports teams that exist in Georgia. The first was... No, we need to tell you. That was a, what, what did you want to... Who did you want to... Uh, I think Matt Ryan was happy. All right. So first to come to Atlanta are the Braves. Of course, they come from Milwaukee. Um, 1966, 10 years later, they're bought by Ted Turner. And they become um, America's team. They were awful. I mean, they were purely awful. Um, have a friend that actually played for the Braves and was their starting shortstop at the end of a year. His name was Rob Belwar. You can look him up. R O B B E L L O I R. Rob Belwar. Um, so he ended the year as the Braves' starting shortstop. He batted. He might have batted two ten. You know, for his career. Um, the next spring he was batting in a spring training game against Cleveland, pitcher named Juan Berenger, hitting with a 105-mile-an-hour fastball right there, shattered his jaw. He retired shortly after. But I've got a group of friends. One of the things we used to do when we get together, just hanging out, is we would try to name all the Atlanta Braves starting shortstops in the 1970s. And there must have been 30 of them because they were just they were a terrible baseball team. Um, but they do have some success in the 90s. They end up winning the World Series in 1995, which, of course, is Atlanta's only professional championship. 
Rob Belwar. It's been the late seventies. Yeah. Well, you know, they won one. What's more impressive? What's more impressive is the divisional titles they won, because that's more difficult to do. No, it doesn't. They didn't make Barry Bonds do anything. Barry Bonds chose to do that himself to make his head swell even bigger. So, oh, got a. Um, let me let me show you just a, a quick video clip of the Braves. Um, it's a historic moment, and I'm showing it to you for for a couple of reasons. First of all, I like watching it, and I like listening to Vin Scully call the play. Um, but Scully says something. I want you to listen for it. No. It's not. Vin Scully would not have been announcing the Braves then. This is 1970 something or other. Yep. Yeah, Ted Turner put him in red pinstripes. People have forgotten that. I never will. He put him in red pinstripes. I think that was a mortal sin. I'm not sure. Okay, this is a message for yeah. all the U.S. homeowners. If you owe less than $356,362 on your home and you have... That's an oddly specific number. Yeah. All right, here we go.
Those two guys spent the night in jail. But it was worth it. <clears throat> Might have been. Um, did you hear what Vin Scully said, though? Did you hear what he said? Well, one thing in particular. Yeah, he's he said... A black man in the deep south is being applauded. And um, I think that's a powerful testimony to what sport can do. You know, a- athletics brings people together. If you've ever been part of an athletic team, you, you don't worry about what color the guy is next to you. You worry about whether or not he can do his job and you can depend on it. And that's what sport does. Um Nelson Mandela, y'all know who Man- Nelson, okay. President of South Africa, first black president of South Africa. When, yeah, I mean, a long time. When he became president, the white population of South Africa was fearful that he was going to take revenge, and he doesn't. Um, the South African Springboks, which is their national rugby team, had been banned from international play because of the policy of apartheid that was used by the South African government. Um, Mandela is able to convince the World Rugby Association to lift the ban, and so they're eligible for uh, play internationally. They play in the World Cup. Um, And Mandela actually becomes a fan of the Springboks. It was kind of um, one of the images of apartheid. And he uses rugby and it could have been any sport, but he uses rugby to bring the nation of South Africa together. And uh, just an incredible story. Um, book by the name of Invictus, and there's also a movie by the same same name. I'd encourage you to watch it. It's pretty good. All right, on, upward, forward. Um, then, of course, we have the Falcons, um, who are being criticized for drafting a tight end um, this morning. He's a good player. He can play. Um, of course, they they um, they visit the Super Bowl. I'm not going to say they played in the Super Bowl, but they visited the Super Bowl twice. 1998, they played a half in 2017. Yeah. Um, Belichick's going to make him come back. He got him a quarterback last night. So. Um, the Hawks, they moved from Atlanta. Um, or to Atlanta from St. Louis. Um, Atlanta United, Major League Soccer. I believe they did win. The best team in Atlanta. Yeah, they did win a uh, two years ago, yeah. 2019, yeah. Um, they're owned by Arthur Blank, who also owns the Falcons, who also used to own Home Depot. I think they're still cursed. We're going to have to sacrifice a goat at noon on the steps of the Capitol building. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the Atlanta Dream, WNBA, women's professional basketball. 
Um, they've actually played in three finals, but have never won. And then the newest professional team, Atlanta Rugby. Um, Atlanta was awarded an MLR franchise in 2019. Um, of course, they started play last year and it was cut short, but they're playing again. Yeah. Now they had a couple of a couple of good ones. They actually during during the time where Jordan and Bird um, were playing, that's the time of Dominique. But you know, you had Spud Webb, you had Tree Rollins, um, you had a couple of other guys that were pretty good basketball players. Of course, Dominique made them all better. Yeah, but that was when he could only do that. Couldn't do that anymore. He could only do that. He might be. He might be. Um, sports logos in Atlanta. Let's see if we can match them up. This is the easy one. And then, of course, this was not too hard either. But what about this one? It's a hockey team. They're not there anymore. Forgot where they moved to. The Atlanta Thrashers. Brown Thrasher. And then this one? Atlanta Flames. They play in Calgary now. This one's pretty easy, the Atlanta Chiefs. And actually, they won a championship back in 1970-71. Soccer team. Um, then you've got the Atlanta Silverbacks. And this is the Atlanta Apollos. These are all soccer teams that have played in Atlanta. So, I don't know why I told you all that, but it just gave me a chance to talk about sports. All right. So, when we think William B. Hartsfield, we want to think transportation, airport, expressway. Okay, yeah. Um, Ivan Allen Jr., we want to think entertainment professional sports teams, um, performing venues for the performing arts, um, display places for the, for the fine arts. So both have a tremendous impact and both help grow not only Atlanta, but Georgia as well. But And I don't see him very often. And I live right across the street from him. Oh, my gosh. His wife, Jan. Y'all know Miss Jan. Both of them went in to have some skin cancers removed. You know, nothing serious. Um, you know, Garland was like 30 minutes and he was done. Jan's was on her nose. And when when the um, dermatologist surgeon, you know, was working on it, he discovered it was much deeper than he first thought. And so he... You know, he tells Jan, um, it's a lot worse than I thought it was. I'm going to have to go deeper. Um, and he ends up he ended up taking off half of her nose. And, you know, she's done plastic surgery. She has a nose again, but they took, <laughs> this is funny. They took skin from her forehead to help make a new nose. And when her forehead, she feels it in her nose. Yeah, it's weird. Um, but anyway, that, nothing to do with this. But And it's on video, too, so I'm sure she'll be happy to know that. So, she plays rugby, too. She really broke her nose playing rugby. All right, let's talk about Ellis Arnold for just a few minutes. Um, remember, he takes over for everybody's pal and buddy, Eugene Talmadge, right? Um, and Talmadge was very dictatorial. If you remember the Dr. Seuss cartoon we looked at when we were talking about the New South, or um, I guess it was World War before we talked about World War One and the Depression. Um, actually, when we we're talking about the Depression, um, you know, it had Talmadge with a bullwhip and a race bird on his shoulder that was a vulture. Um, that was Talmadge's leadership style, very dictatorial. Uh, what do you notice about the flag in the background? Look familiar? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Um, so what does Ellis Arnold accomplish? Well, education is his top priority. Um, Talmadge, he's not even up there. 
Talmadge had I'm trying to think of the nice way to say this. Talmadge, Talmadge caused Georgia, the University of Georgia, to lose its accreditation. Not only Georgia, but other universities as well within the state because of his meddling in university affairs. So what does Ellis Arnold do? He takes, he removes the office of governor from the Board of Regents, from the group that runs the university system in the state of Georgia. So now it's run independently of the governor's office. That was a good move. Um, UGA gets their accreditation back. He lowers the voting age from 21 to 18 before the rest of the nation did. And he abolishes the poll tax in Georgia. So now it doesn't matter if you are wealthy or poor, if you're registered to vote, you can vote. And so he kind of levels the playing field when it comes to voting a little bit. Um, great quote from Ellis Arnold. We have heard enough about being practical, efficient, and prudent. We heard it preached through several decades that these things would save the world. I think that with the salty taste of blood and sweat on our lips, we're learning that we had best talk once again about doing what is right. What is Ellis Arnold saying? He said, doesn't matter if it's practical, doesn't matter if it's prudent, doesn't matter if it's efficient. We need to do what's right. And, and, I don't know about you, but that inspires. It really does. And we need more of that today. But people don't talk like this anymore. You notice that? You know, you don't hear John F. Kennedy ask not what you can do for your, or ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. We don't hear that anymore. We hear it's his fault. No, nope, it's her fault. Right. Oh, we got one of those coming up too here in just a little bit. So, um, Arnold helps to rewrite Georgia's constitution for probably the sixth or seventh time. I'd have to go back and look. Um, an incredible thing that Arnold is able to do is he gets rid of the state's debt. And I just got to tell you, if you're a politician and you can get rid of, a, of your constituency's debt, you, you've done a remarkable job. Just think what kind of shape our country would be in if our government would not be in debt, if we could get rid of the trillions of dollars of debt that we carry. Whew. And then prison reform. He is the champion of prison reform. He gets rid of the chain gang, which had been, um, which had replaced rather the convict lease system. And that's important because the prison system, the, the justice system was unfairly tilted against black folks. Yeah. He's a Democrat. You know, this is still the Democratic white primary. It's still the county unit system. And he's able to get elected. Um, primarily, I think, because people were tired of Eugene Talmadge's rhetoric. A very progressive Southern white politician. Uh, might be why he only had one term. So he accomplishes this in that one term. If I'm not mistaken. He might have had two terms. But again, it's just a two-year term. Just a couple of, you don't have to write any of this down, but just a couple of quotes that I think um, help you see a little bit about Ellis Arnold. Education is the cure for ignorance, poverty, and disease. Can you argue with that? Nope, you can't. Government. There's nothing wrong with government that democracy won't cure. Huh. I think he's right. Um, he's a lawyer, of course. Equality. There will come a time when equality is not only publicly accepted, but privately accepted as well. What does he mean by that? Yeah. Right. And if you truly believe that, then your friendship circle is probably going to reflect that, right? Um, laws that discriminate based on race have been in the 
Yeah, I mean, it. how many of you have, have heard or seen a politician, black or white, get up and talk about equality? All of us, right? What's more important is when they're sitting around the dinner table with their family at night, how do they talk about equality? Because that's what they truly believe. And that's what Ellis Arnold is saying. It can't just be publicly accepted. It's got to be privately accepted. It has become, has become part of our uh, moral fiber of who we are. Um, and then economics. The monument to my governorship is that we brought about the union on the basis of full fellowship and full equality. And he's talking about fair opportunity, equal opportunity, that kind of thing. Um, he really helps bring Georgia out of that agricultural-based economy into more industry and trade. And we'll see that as we move forward here in just a little bit. So let's see if we can get through the three governors episode. It's kind of hilarious if you stop and think about it. Um, Eugene Talmadge is elected governor again right after World War II. Eugene Talmadge is sick. Everybody knows he's sick. The Democratic Party knows he's sick. Um, and that comes into play. Hopefully, they can get him elected and sworn in before he dies. Eugene didn't play along. He died. Stone, cold, dead. Liver disease brought on by most likely alcohol. And so Georgia has a problem. Georgia doesn't have a lieutenant governor. That office had not been established yet. And so Georgia has a problem. Who's the governor? We are in constitutional crisis. Ellis Arnold says that he should be governor. Melvin Thompson, who was just elected lieutenant governor, but had not taken the oath of office, said he should be governor. And then Eugene reaches up from the grave and sends his son and says he should be the governor. Arnold claims he should be governor until they can figure it out. Why? Because he's already in the office. That makes sense? I mean, it's a rational approach to the problem. Melvin Thompson feels like he should be governor because he won the office of lieutenant governor, the first time Georgia had elected a lieutenant governor. Now stop and think about that for just a second. Does that make sense? I mean, what do you do? You swear in Melvin Thompson, he becomes the governor. Yeah, like the I mean, yeah, I mean, isn't that a simple solution to really what was a simple problem? We didn't do it that way. Yeah, Herman Talmadge claims that he should be governor because he got more write-in votes than anybody else. Or did he? Or did he? Here we go. James, the way this guy writes history. Um, meanwhile, much to the consternation of the Talmadge camp, the initial vote count showed, these are the write-in votes, showed that 669 hardcore Talmadge haters had written in Carmichael on their general election ballots. Behind Carmichael came not the younger Talmadge, but perennial Republican write-in candidate D. Talmadge Bowers with 637 votes. Herman had apparently received only 619 write-in votes. And because the legislature was to choose from only the top two candidates, it seemed as though the son of Gene Talmadge would be denied the opportunity to succeed his father. As l Hang on. As luck would have it, however... Officials in Talmadge's home county of Telfair made a startling last-second discovery. Some 56 write-ins for Herman had been misplaced among the returns for the lieutenant governor's race. Subsequent examination of these newly discovered ballots brought further and even more startling re revelations. All of the misplaced votes for Talmadge have been cast by dead people, many of whom displayed a remarkably similar handwriting style. As one journalist deadpanned, they rose from the dead in Telfair County, marched in alphabetical order to the polls, cast their votes for Herman Talmadge, and went back to their last repose. And that's how Herman Talmadge stole the governorship of Georgia, right there. All right. You know what I always say vote often, 
Vote early. Or vote early, vote often, either way. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. 